Welcome to Catholic Culture Audiobooks, part of the Catholic Culture Podcast Network and a production of catholicculture.org. Visit catholicculture.org to access Catholic news, incisive commentary, and a treasure trove of other Catholic resources. Or sign up for one of our email newsletters at catholicculture.org slash newsletters. Today's reading, The Shepherd of Hermes, Mandates, translated by Joseph M. F. Marik, S.J., narrated by James T. Majewski. First Mandate Belief in One God, Fear of God First of all, believe that there is one God, that He created all things and set them in order, that He caused all things to pass from non-existence to existence, and that though He contains all things, He is Himself uncontained. Trust Him, then, and fear Him and in this fear be continent. Observe this mandate and throw far from you all wickedness. Clothe yourself with every excellence that goes with justice, and you will live to God provided you observe this command. Second Mandate Avoid slander. Do good. He said to me, Hold fast to simplicity of heart and innocence. Yes, be as infants who do not know the wickedness that destroys the life of men. In the first place, do not speak against anybody and do not listen readily to a slanderer. Otherwise you, the listener, will be guilty of the sin of the slanderer in case you believe the slander you hear. For by believing it, you yourself will hold a grudge against your brother, and thus you will be guilty of the sin of the slanderer. Slander is wicked a restless devil, never at peace, but always dwelling amid dissensions. Keep away from it, and you will always be on good terms with all men. Clothe yourself with reverence in which there is no evil, which gives no offense, which is all smoothness and cheerfulness. Do good, and from the fruit of your labors, God's gift, give to all those in need, without distinction, not debating to whom you will and to whom you will not give. Since it is God's will that we give to all from his bounties, give to all. Those who have received will give an account to God why they received and for what purpose. For those that receive in distress will not be judged, but those that receive under false pretenses will pay the penalty. Under these circumstances, the giver is innocent. For on receiving from the Lord a service to perform, He performed it with simplicity, without distinguishing to whom to give and to whom not to give. The service, then, performed with simplicity, becomes honorable in God's eyes. Therefore the man who thus serves with simplicity will live to God. Keep this commandment as I have told you, that you and your house may be found sincere in your repentance and your heart clean and unsullied. Third Mandate. Do not lie. Again he spoke to me. Love truth, and let nothing but truth issue from your mouth, in order that the spirit which God has settled in this flesh of yours may be found to be truthful in the sight of all men. Thus the Lord who dwells in you will be glorified, since the Lord is truthful in every word and there is no lie in him. This is why liars ignore the Lord and defraud Him, since they do not return the deposit received from Him, namely, a spirit in which there is no lie. If they return this falsified, they have besmirched the command of the Lord and become robbers. On hearing this I wept copiously. At sight of my tears he said, Why do you weep? Because, sir, I said, I do not know whether it is possible for me to be saved. Why, he said. Because, sir, I said, I have not yet spoken a true word in my life. At all times I have lived like a villain among all men and have dressed up my lie as the truth in the eyes of all. At no time have I been contradicted by anybody, but they have put faith in my word. How, I said, can I live, sir, after having done this? 
Your intentions are noble and true, he said. It was really your duty as the servant of God to walk in truth and not allow an evil conscience to dwell in the company of the spirit of truth. Neither ought you to cause grief to the spirit of truth and holiness. Sir, I said, I have never correctly understood these commands. Well, now you do, he said. Keep them, that even the lies formerly uttered in your business transactions may become credible now that your present remarks have been found true. It is really possible for these business lies to become credible, for if you keep watch over what you say and speak nothing but the strict truth from now on, you can obtain life for yourself, and anybody who hears this command and abstains from that most pernicious habit, lying, will live to God. Fourth Mandate 1. Preserve chastity. I command you, he said, to guard purity. Let it not enter your heart to think of another man's wife, nor about fornication, nor any such thing. If you do, you will commit a serious sin. Keep your wife in mind always, and you will never fall into sin. For if this desire comes into your heart, you will make a slip and you will commit sin if any other such wicked thought enters your heart. For a desire of this kind is a serious sin for the servant of God, and if anyone puts into execution such a wicked thought, he draws death upon himself. Be on your guard, then. Keep this desire from you. Where holiness dwells, there, in the heart of a just man, lawlessness should not enter. I said to him, Sir, allow me to ask you a few questions. Ask them, he said. Sir, I said, if a man has a wife who believes in the Lord and surprises her in adultery, does he commit sin if he lives with her? Before he finds out, he said, he does not. But if her husband knows the sin and she does not repent but persists in her fornication, he becomes guilty of her sin as long as he lives with her and an accomplice in her adultery. Sir, I said, what then is he to do if the wife continues in this passion? Let him divorce her, he said, and remain single. But if he divorces her and marries another woman, he himself commits adultery. But if, sir, I said, after the divorce, the wife repents and wishes to return to her husband. Will he refuse to receive her? No, indeed, he said. If the husband does not receive her, he sins. He incurs a great sin. The sinner who has repented must be received. However, not often, for there is only one repentance for the servants of God. To bring about her repentance, then, the husband should not marry. This is the course of action required for husband and wife. Not only is it adultery, he said, for a man to pollute his flesh, but it is likewise adultery for anyone to act in imitation of the pagans. So if anyone persists in acts of this kind and does not repent, keep away from him, do not live with him, otherwise you also have a part in his sin. This is the reason why you were commanded to live by yourselves, whether husband or wife be guilty. For under these circumstances, repentance is possible. I am not giving an excuse, he said, that this may be the conclusion of the matter, but merely that the sinner may sin no more. There is one who can give a remedy for his former sin, and he has power over all things. 2. Penance is understanding. Once more I asked him and said, Since the Lord has thought me worthy of having you live with me always, bear with me for a few more words, since I do not understand anything at all and my heart has been hardened by my past. Give me understanding, for I am exceedingly stupid and understand absolutely nothing. He answered in these words, I am in charge of penance, he said, and give understanding to all who repent. Do you not think, he asked, 
that this very act of repentance is understanding? Repentance, he continued, is deep understanding. For the man who has sinned, then, understands that he has done evil before the Lord. The deed he committed enters his heart, and he repents, never to commit evil again. Instead, he does good perfectly by humbling his soul and putting it to the torture because it has sinned. Do you see now how repentance is deep understanding? Sir, I said, the following are the reasons why I am making accurate inquiries into everything. In the first place, I am a sinner, and then I do not know what works I am to perform to live, for my sins are numerous and varied. You will live, he said, if you keep my commandments and walk in them. Whoever hears my commandments and keeps them will live to God. 3. Penance is for those who have been baptized. May I press on with my question, sir? I asked. Yes, he said. Sir, I said. I have been told by some teachers that there is no other repentance except the one, when we went into the water and received remission for our former sins. He said to me, You have been correctly told. Such is the case. For the person who has received remission of sins must no longer sin, but live in purity. However, since you are inquiring accurately into everything, I shall also clarify this matter for you without giving an excuse either to those who now believe or are destined to believe in the Lord. For those who now believe or are destined to believe do not have repentance for sins, but they do have remission of their former sins. The Lord, then, has prescribed repentance for those who were called before these days. For the Lord has knowledge of hearts and knows all things in advance, the weakness of human beings and cunning craft of the devil, the evil he will do to the servants of God and his wickedness against them. Therefore the Lord in his exceeding mercy took pity on his creatures and prescribed this occasion for repentance. Authority over this repentance has been given to me. But this I say to you, he said, after that solemn and holy call, if a man sins after severe temptation by the devil, he has one chance of repentance. But if he sins and repents offhandedly, it is unprofitable for such a man. Only with difficulty will he live. I said to him, I have been restored to life by hearing these accurate statements of yours. For now I know that, if I do not commit additional sins, I shall be saved. You will be saved, he said as well as all those who do this. 4. Second marriage is not recommended. Once more I spoke and asked him, Sir, since you have borne with me once, make this also clear to me. What is it? he said. Sir, I said, if a wife or husband is deceased and either one of the survivors marries again, does he or she sin by marrying? There is no sin, he said, but anyone who remains single achieves greater honor for himself and great glory before the Lord. But even in remarriage there is no sin. Keep a watchful eye, then, on purity and modesty, and live for God. All that I am telling you and am going to tell you, observe from now on, from the day on which you have been entrusted to me, and I shall dwell in your house. There will be remission for your former lapses, if you observe my commandments. There will also be remission for all who observe these commandments and walk in like purity. Fifth Mandate 1. Praise of Long-Suffering Be long-suffering, he said, and prudent, and you will obtain the mastery over wickedness and accomplish all justice. For if you are long-suffering, the Holy Spirit dwelling in you will be clear, unobscured by any other spirit of evil. Dwelling in a spacious place, he will rejoice and be glad with the lodging in which he finds himself. 
Thus he will serve God with abundant cheerfulness, because he has his well-being within himself. However, if violent anger enters, the good spirit in his sensitiveness is immediately confined, since he has not a clean habitation. So he tries to withdraw from the place. The evil spirit chokes him. He is unable to serve God in accordance with his wishes. He is befouled by the violent anger. For the Lord dwells amid long-suffering, but the devil has his abode in anger. Therefore, if both spirits dwell in the same place, it is unprofitable and evil for the man in whom they dwell. Take a little wormwood and pour it into a jar of honey. Is not the honey spoiled altogether? Even a great quantity of honey is ruined by the smallest amount of wormwood, and its sweetness is lost. It is no longer pleasant to the owner, because it has been mixed and it is no longer enjoyable. Now, if no wormwood is put into the honey, it turns out to be sweet and becomes useful for the owner. You see, then, that long-suffering is very sweet, far more than honey, and useful to the Lord. His dwelling is in long-suffering. Anger, on the contrary, is bitter and useless to him. So if anger is mixed with long-suffering, the latter is spoiled, and the man's prayer to God is not useful. Sir, I would like to know the operation of anger to be on my guard against it, I said. Yes, indeed, he replied. If you do not guard against it, you and your house, all hope is lost for you. Do guard against it. I shall be on your side, and all who repent with their whole heart will be preserved from it. I shall be on their side, and shall watch carefully in their behalf, for all have been justified by the most holy angel. 2. Evil Effects of Anger I shall tell you now, he said, of the operation of anger, its wickedness, how it destroys the servants of God, how it makes them swerve from justice. Now, it does not cause the majority of those who are in the faith to swerve, neither is it able to operate against them, because the power of the Lord is on their side. But it causes the empty-minded and those of divided purpose to swerve. For when it sees people of this kind in prosperity, it insinuates itself into the heart of such a person, and... For no reason at all, the man or woman is embittered over worldly concerns, either about food or some trifle, some friend, a benefaction or a gift, or other such foolish matters. All this is foolish, vain, senseless, and unprofitable to the servants of God. But long-suffering is great and steadfast, sturdy and powerful. It prospers expansively. It is cheerful, joyous, carefree. It praises the Lord at all times. It has no bitterness in itself, but in all circumstances it remains meek and calm. So, this long-suffering dwells with those who hold on to the faith in its perfection. Now, in the first place, violent anger is foolish, frivolous, and silly. In the next place, bitterness arises from silliness, from silliness, wrath, from wrath, anger, and from anger, rage. Finally, the rage that has in it such evil elements becomes a serious and incurable sin. For when all such spirits dwell in one vessel along with the Holy Spirit, it cannot hold them, but overflows. Then the delicate spirit that is not accustomed to dwell with an evil one nor with uncouthness departs from a man of this kind, and tries to dwell in a gentle, calm abode. Then, when he has left, the man in whom he dwelled becomes emptied of the righteous spirit. He is filled with evil spirits afterwards, and disorderly in all his actions, dragged here and there by evil spirits. In a word, he is blind to all good intentions. This is what happens to those subject to violent anger. Keep away from violent anger, the most wicked spirit. Put on long-suffering and oppose violent anger as well as bitterness, and you will be found on the side of holiness, beloved by the Lord. Make sure, then, that you do not forget this command. For if you master this commandment, 
you will also be able to keep the other commandments which I am about to lay upon you. Gain strength and power in their observance, and let all those who wish to walk in accordance with them also gain such power. Sixth Mandate 1. The Good and the Evil Path In the first mandate, he said, I bade you keep the faith, fear of the Lord, and continence. Yes, sir, I said. But now I wish to explain their nature, that you may know their individual power and effect. Well, their effects are twofold, for they relate both to the just and to the unjust. Trust righteousness, but distrust unrighteousness. For the path of righteousness is straight, but wickedness is a crooked path. So walk in the straight path and leave the crooked path alone. For there are no beaten tracks on the crooked path. Instead, there is nothing but wastelands and numerous obstacles. It is rough and full of thorns. So it is injurious to those who walk in it. Those who take the straight path walk smoothly without stumbling, because it is neither rough nor thorny. Hence you see that it is more advantageous for you to walk in this road. Sir, I said, it is on this road that I like to walk. Walk in it then, he said, and anyone who turns to the Lord wholeheartedly will also walk there. 2. The Angels of Righteousness and of Evil Now I am going to tell you about faith, he said. There are two angels who accompany man, the angel of justice and the angel of wickedness. But how am I to know their operations, I said, if both are dwelling within me? Listen, he said, and you will understand them. The angel of justice is sensitive, modest, gentle, and calm. So when this angel comes into your heart, he will immediately converse with you about justice purity, holiness, self-control, every just work and glorious virtue. When all these thoughts enter your heart, you can be sure that the angel of justice is within you. These are the deeds of the angel of justice. Believe him, then, and his deeds also. Now observe the deeds of the angel of wickedness. First of all, he is of a violent temper, bitter and silly. His deeds are evil, the undoing of the servants of God. So when he enters your heart, know him from his deeds. Sir, I do not know how I shall recognize him, I said. I shall tell you, he said. When violent anger comes over you, or bitterness, you can tell that he is within you. Then there arises the craving for excessive action, extravagance in many things to eat and drink, numerous feasts, varied, unnecessary dishes, the desire for women, covetousness, arrogance, boasting, and a host of similar related excesses. When they arise in your heart, you can tell that the angel of wickedness is with you. So then, since you know his deeds, keep away from him and put no trust in him, because his deeds are wicked and against the interests of God's servants. Here you have the workings of the two spirits. Understand them, and trust the angel of justice. Keep away from the angel of wickedness, because his teaching is evil in every respect. For even though a person have faith, if the desire of this angel arises in the heart, that man or woman is bound to commit some sin. Now. On the other hand, though a man or woman is very wicked, when the deeds of the angel of justice suggest themselves, they must necessarily perform a good action. So you see, he said, that it is good to follow the angel of justice and to put yourself out of range of the angel of wickedness. This much this commandment makes clear about faith, that you may believe the deeds of the angel of justice and live to God by performing them. Believe that the deeds of the angel of wickedness are difficult, and if you do not perform them, you will live to God. Seventh Mandate On the Fear of God 
Fear the Lord and keep his commandments, he said. So, by keeping God's commandments, you will be powerful in every action, and your action will be beyond criticism. Fear the Lord, then, and you will do everything well. This is the fear you must have to be saved. Do not fear the devil. By fearing the Lord you will gain the mastery of the devil, for there is no power in him. For there can be no fear of him in whom there is no power, but of him whose might is glorious there must be fear. For everyone who has power inspires fear, but he who has no power is despised by everybody. However, fear the deeds of the devil, because they are evil. If you fear the Lord, you will fear the devil's deeds. Do not perform them, but keep aloof from them. There are two kinds of fear, then. If you wish to do evil, fear the Lord, and you will not do it. So, too, if you wish to do good, fear the Lord, and you will do it. Consequently, the fear of the Lord is security, mighty and glorious. Fear the Lord, then, and live for him. All those who fear him and keep his commandments will live to God. Sir, I said, why do you say about those who observe his commandments, they will live to God? Because, he said, all creatures fear the Lord, but not all creation keeps his commandments. But life with God is for those who both fear him and keep his commandments nor is there life in him for those who fail to keep his commandments. Eighth Mandate On Continence I told you, he said, that God's creatures are twofold. Now, temperance also is twofold. For in some things we have to restrain ourselves, and in others we do not. Let me know, sir, I said, in what we must restrain ourselves, and in what we must not. I shall tell you, he said. Restrain yourself from evil, and do not do it. From good, however, do not restrain yourself, but do it. For if you restrain yourself and keep from doing good, you commit a serious sin. But if you restrain yourself and abstain from doing evil, you achieve signal righteousness. Restrain yourself from all evil by doing good. What are the kinds of evil, sir, I said, from which we must hold off? I shall tell you, he said, from adultery and fornication, from uncontrolled drunkenness, from evil luxury, from excessive food and extravagant wealth, from boastfulness and pride, from lying, backbiting and hypocrisy, vengefulness and all blasphemy. These deeds are worst of all in the life of all human beings. From such deeds, then, a servant of God must restrain himself. The person who does not cannot live to God. Now let me tell you the consequences of such deeds. Sir, I said, are there still other evil deeds? Yes, indeed many, and the servant of God must restrain himself from them. Theft, lying, robbery, false witness, covetousness, lust, deceit, vainglory, pretense, and similar excesses. Surely you think such sins are wicked, very wicked indeed, he said, for servants of God. A servant of God should restrain himself from all these excesses. Restrain yourself, then, that you may live to God, and that you may be enrolled with those who restrain themselves in these matters. So the foregoing are the matters in which you should exercise self-restraint. I shall now tell you from what you should not hold off, he said, and what you ought to perform. Do not refrain from good, but do it. Sir, make clear to me also the nature of good, I said, that I may walk in it and be subject to it, and by doing it may be saved. I shall also tell you, he answered, the deeds of goodness that you are to perform and from which you are not to hold back, he said. In the forefront are faith, fear of the Lord, love, concord, upright speech, truthfulness, patience. 
there is nothing superior to these in the life of human beings. If a person keeps these virtues and does not hold back from them, he will be blessed in his life. Let me enumerate also the consequent good actions, the assistance of widows, visiting orphans and the poor, ransoming God's servants in their difficulties, showing hospitality, for benevolence occasionally finds play in hospitality, non-resistance to anyone, being of a quiet disposition, being poorer than all men, honoring the aged, practicing justice, exercising fraternal charity, enduring insult, being long-suffering, abstaining from spite, comforting those who are troubled in spirit, not rejecting those who have stumbled in the faith, but winning them back and encouraging them, calling sinners to order, not oppressing debtors in their needs, all this and more besides. Do you not think these acts are good? Sir, there is nothing better than such acts, I said. Walk in them, then, and do not hold back from them, he said, and you will live to God. Observe this commandment. If you do good without restraint, you will live to God, just as all those will live to God who do likewise. So too will you live to God, if you avoid doing evil and hold back from it. Whoever observes these commandments and walks in them will also live to God. Ninth Mandate On Confident Prayer He said to me, Cast off indecision, and doubt not in the least when asking anything from God. Do not say, How can I ask and receive anything from the Lord after having committed so many sins? Do not entertain such thoughts, but with your whole heart turn to the Lord and ask Him without wavering. You will learn His superabundant mercy. He will not leave you in the lurch, no. He will fulfill the request of your soul. God is not like human beings who bear a grudge. He is without malice and has mercy on what He has made. Cleanse your heart, then, of all the vanities of this world and of the vices mentioned above. Then ask of the Lord and you will receive all. You cannot fail to obtain all your requests, provided you ask the Lord without wavering. However, if you waver in your heart, you will not receive a single one of your requests. Those who are divided in purpose are they who waver before the Lord and altogether fail to obtain any of their requests. But those who are wholly perfect in the faith ask everything with reliance on the Lord and they receive, because they ask without wavering, without divided purpose. Every man of divided purpose will be saved with difficulty unless he repents. Cleanse your heart, then, of divided purpose. Clothe yourself with faith, because it is strong, and put your trust in God, confident that you will receive every request you make of Him. Now, if some time or other, after having made it, you receive your request from the Lord rather slowly, do not doubt because you did not receive your soul's request quickly. In general, you receive your request slowly because of some temptation or some shortcoming of which you are not aware. Do not let up, then, in the request of your soul. But if in your request you grow faint and doubt, blame yourself and not the giver. Be on your guard against this divided purpose, for it is evil and senseless. It uproots many from the faith, however strong in faith they are. For divided purpose is the daughter of the devil and exceedingly wicked to the servants of God. Despise divided purpose and gain the mastery of it in everything by clothing yourself with strong and powerful faith. For faith promises all things and accomplishes them, but divided purpose, without confidence in itself, fails in all its works. You see then, he said, that faith is from above from the Lord, and its power is great, whereas divided purpose is an earthly spirit, from the devil, lacking in power. Be subject, then, to the faith that has power, and hold aloof from divided purpose that lacks power, and you will live to God as well as all who are of the same mind. 
Tenth Mandate 1. Sadness is worse than lack of confidence or anger. Take sorrow out of your heart, he said, for it is a sister of divided purpose and violent anger. How is it a sister of these two, I said. It seems to me that anger is one thing and divided purpose another, and sorrow still another. You are a senseless man, he said, not to know that sorrow is more wicked than all spirits and most dangerous to servants of God. More than all spirits, it destroys a human being and wears out the Holy Spirit, but again saves it. I am a man without understanding, I said, and do not follow these parables. I do not see how it can wear out and then again save. I shall tell you, he said. There are those who have never made deeper inquiry into the truth nor about God. They merely believe, while they are involved in business, wealth, pagan friendship, and many other commitments of this world. People intent on such matters fail to grasp the parables of the Godhead, for these occupations keep their minds in darkness. They are corrupted and become barren. Just as good vineyards, when not cared for, grow barren with thorns and various weeds, so believers, who become involved in the aforementioned numerous occupations, lose their understanding and are altogether without perception for justice. When they hear about the Godhead and truth, their mind is taken up with their business, and they understand absolutely nothing. It is different with those who have the fear of God and make inquiry into the divine nature and truth with hearts directed to the Lord. They understand more quickly what is told them and penetrate its meaning because they have the fear of the Lord. Wherever the Lord dwells, there also is much understanding. Cling to the Lord, and you will grasp and understand everything. 2. Sadness has evil effects. Let me tell you now, slow-witted man, how melancholy wears out the Holy Spirit and again lightens it. When the man of divided purpose applies himself to any practice and fails in it because of his divided purpose, this melancholy enters into him and the Holy Spirit is in gloom and is worn out. So also when violent anger clings to the man about some matter and he is very much embittered, melancholy enters the heart of the angry man. He is then distressed at the action he performed and repents because he did evil. Now this melancholy seems to bring salvation because he repents of having done evil. So both deeds distress the spirit, the divided purpose because he has not succeeded in the action itself, the anger because he committed evil. The two, then, divided purpose and anger, are saddening to the Holy Spirit. Remove melancholy, then, and do not oppress the Holy Spirit dwelling within you, lest he pray to God to depart from you. For the Spirit of God that was given to this flesh does not endure melancholy and confinement. 3. Joy brings blessings. Sadness is harmful. Clothe yourself with cheerfulness, which always finds favor with God and is acceptable to Him. Rejoice in it. For every cheerful man does good, has good thoughts, and despises melancholy. On the other hand, the melancholy man is always committing sin. In the first place, he commits sin because he brings melancholy to the Holy Spirit that was given to man as a spirit of gladness. In the second place, by bringing melancholy to the Holy Spirit, he commits grave sin because he does not intercede with God nor confess to God. Why does not the intercourse of the melancholy man reach up to the altar of God, I said? Because melancholy resides in his heart. Consequently, the melancholy mingled with his converse does not let his prayer ascend clean to the altar. Just as vinegar mixed with wine in the same vessel does not have the same agreeable taste, so also melancholy associated with the Holy Spirit has not the same power of impenetration. Cleanse yourself, then, of this wicked melancholy, and you will live to God. 
so also will they live to God, who cast away melancholy and clothe themselves in complete cheerfulness. Eleventh Mandate On True and False Prophets He pointed out to me men sitting on a bench and another man sitting on a chair. Do you see the men sitting on the bench? he said to me. Yes, sir, I replied. These men are believers, he said, and the man sitting on the chair is a false prophet who corrupts the understanding of God's servants. However, he corrupts the understanding of those who are doubters, not of the believers. These doubtful men, then, come to him as to a wizard and ask him about their future. That false prophet, without having in himself any power from a divine spirit, then speaks with them along the lines of their questions, in accordance with their evil desires, and fills their souls just as they wish. Empty as he is, it is empty answers that he gives to empty minds. For whatever inquiry is made, his answer is directed to the emptiness of a man. However, some of the words he utters are true, for the devil fills him with his own spirit to see whether he can break down one of the just. So those who are strong in the faith of the Lord clothe themselves with truth and do not cling to this kind of spirit. No, they keep at a distance from such spirits. But those who are doubting souls repent frequently, consult fortune-tellers like the pagans, and bring a greater sin upon themselves with their idolatry. For the person who consults a false prophet about some action is an idolater, empty of truth and stupid. For no spirit granted by God has to be consulted. It speaks everything with the Godhead's power, because it is from above, from the power of the divine spirit. But the spirit that is consulted and speaks according to the desires of men is earthly and weak, without any power. Besides, it does not speak at all unless it be consulted. How, sir, I said, is a man to know which of them is a prophet and which is a false prophet? I shall tell you about both prophets, he said. In accordance with what I am going to tell you, you can test the true and the false prophet. Test a man who has the divine spirit according to his life. In the first place, the man who has the spirit from above is meek, calm, humble. He abstains from all wickedness and vain desires of this world and considers that he is inferior to all men. He does not give answers to questions either, nor does he speak by himself, neither does the Holy Spirit speak when a man wishes him to speak. But he speaks, then, when God wishes him to speak. When a man who has the divine spirit enters a gathering of just men who have faith in God's spirit, and an entreaty is addressed to God by such a gathering, at that moment the angel of the prophetic spirit, who is attached to this man, fills him, and in the fullness of the Holy Spirit he speaks to the gathering in accordance with the Lord's wishes. In this manner, then, the spirit of the deity will be made clear, this, then, is the power of the Lord's divine spirit. Now I shall tell you, he said, about the earthly spirit that is inane, powerless, and truly foolish. In the first place, the man who thinks he has a spirit exalts himself and wishes to have the seat of honor. Immediately he is reckless, impudent, indulges in considerable luxury and in many other deceits, he also takes pay for his prophecy and makes no prophecy unless he receives it. Can the divine spirit receive money for prophesying? It is impossible for a spirit of God to do this, whereas the spirit of this kind of prophet is earthly. Furthermore, it does not approach gatherings of just men at all, but avoids them. It clings to the men who are doubters and to the vain, making prophecies to them in a corner, deceiving them by talk in accordance with their lusts, all in empty fashion, for their answers are to be empty. For the empty vessel placed with other empty vessels does not break, but they match one another. Now, when he comes to a gathering filled with just men who have the divine spirit, 
Such a man is emptied after their prayer of petition. The earthly spirit in fear takes flight from him, and he is struck dumb, completely falling to pieces without the power of saying a thing. For if you stack wine and oil into a cellar and place an empty jar among the rest, when you wish to unstack the cellar, you will find the one you placed there just as empty. In the same way, also, vacuous prophets. After entering the souls of just men, they are found to be exactly the same as when they came in. The life of the two kinds of prophets has just been given you. Test, then, by life and actions, the man who says he is inspired. Put your faith in the spirit that comes from God and has power, but put no faith in the earthly, empty spirit, because there is no power in him. He comes from the devil. Listen to the parable I am going to tell you. Pick up a stone and throw it up, and see whether you can touch the heavens. Or again, take a syringe full of water and squirt up to the heavens and see whether you can bore through. Sir, I said, how can this be done? According to you, both these actions are impossible. Just as these actions are impossible, he said, so too are the earthly spirits powerless and feeble. Now compare the power that comes from above. A hailstone is quite a small missile, but when it falls on a man's head, it causes considerable pain. Another example, a drop of fluid falling from a jug onto the ground bores through a stone. Hence you see that the lightest possible objects falling from above have great power. So too is the divine spirit that comes from above powerful. Put your trust, then, in this spirit, and keep away from the other. Twelfth Mandate 1. Evil desire works havoc with the imprudent. He said to me, Remove every evil desire, and clothe yourself with good and holy desire. For if you are clothed in this good desire, you will hate the evil desire and bridle it as you please. For evil desire is fierce and is tamed with difficulty. It is fearsome in its ferocity and wastes men. In particular, if a servant of God becomes entangled in it and has no prudence, it works dreadful havoc with him. But it costs a heavy price to those who have not the cloak of good desire and are engrossed with this world. Such men it hands over to death. Sir, I said, what are the works of evil desire which hand a man over to death? Tell me, so I may keep away from them. You will hear, he said, by what works evil desire brings death to the servants of God. 2. The Bad Effects of Evil Desire In the forefront, are the desire of another man's wife or another wife's husband, the desire of profuse wealth, of many useless foods and drinks, and of numerous other foolish luxuries. For every luxury is foolish and empty for the servant of God. Such desires, then, are evil and death-dealing to the servants of God. An evil desire of this kind is the daughter of the devil. Therefore, one has to abstain from evil desires and by abstention live to God. Those who are overpowered by them and do not resist finally die, since these desires are deadly. As for you, put on the desire of justice and armed with the fear of the Lord, resist them. For fear of the Lord has its dwelling in good desire. If evil desire sees you armed with the fear of God and resisting, it will flee far away, and you will not set eyes on it, because it fears your arms. So, after receiving the crown for your victory against evil desire, advance to the desire of justice and attribute the victory to this. Serve the wishes of justice. If you serve and are subject to good desire, you will be able to master evil desire and hold it in subjection as you please. 
3. How good desire is to be maintained. Sir, I said, I should like to know how I have to serve good desire. I shall tell you, he said. Practice justice and virtue, truthfulness and fear of the Lord, faith, meekness, and all similar good acts. By doing this you will be a pleasing servant of God and will live to Him. So will live to God those who are servants of good desires. With this he completed the twelve mandates. He then said to me, These are the mandates. Walk in them, and exhort those who hear you, that their repentance may be clean for the rest of their days. Fulfill with utmost care the ministry I have given you, and work hard. You will find favor with those who are going to repent, and they will obey your words. For I shall be on your side, and will bring them to obey you. I said to him, Sir, these mandates are great, good, and glorious, and capable of gladdening the heart of the man who is able to observe them. But I do not know whether these mandates can be kept by men, because they are exceedingly hard. For answer he said to me, If you persuade yourself that they can be observed, you will do so easily, and they will not be hard. But if you let the thought get into you that they cannot be observed by a human being, you will not observe them. But now I tell you solemnly, if you do not observe them, but neglect them, neither you, nor your children, nor your household will have salvation, since you have passed judgment on yourself by the impossibility for a human being of observing these mandates. 4. Man Should Be Master of His Desires He said this with such excessive anger that I was confounded and very much afraid of him. His appearance had so changed that no human being could stand up against his anger. On seeing my utter distress and confusion, he began to address me more gently and cheerfully in these words. Foolish man, without understanding and of doubtful heart, you do not realize how great, strong, and marvelous is God's glory. It was for man that he created the world, and it is to man that he has subjected all his creation, giving him the mastery over everything that is under the heavens. Now if man is the master of all creation and has the mastery of everything, certainly he can acquire mastery of these mandates. The man who has the Lord in his heart, he said, can master all things and all these mandates. But the persons who have the Lord on their lips, while their heart is hardened, who are in fact far from the Lord, for them these mandates are difficult and hard to fulfill. Put the Lord in your hearts then, you who are empty and fickle in the faith. You will then know that nothing is easier, sweeter, or more gentle than these mandates. Be converted, you who walk in the commandments of the devil, commandments that are hard, bitter, cruel, and foul. And do not fear the devil either, because he has no power against you. I, the angel of repentance, who have overcome the devil, am on your side. The devil only causes fear, but his fear is of no consequence. Do not fear him, then, and he will flee from you. 5. The devil cannot harm those of strong faith. I said to him, Sir, let me say a few words. Say what you please, he answered. Sir, I said, man is eager to keep God's commandments, and there is not one who does not entreat the Lord to be strengthened in his commandments and to submit to them. But the devil is harsh and lords it over them. The devil cannot lord it over those who are servants of God with their whole heart and who place their hope in him. The devil can wrestle with, 
but not overcome them. So if you resist him, he will flee from you in defeat and confusion. But empty men, he said, fear him as if he had power. When a man fills an ample number of jars with good wine, and among these jars are a few half-empty, he does not pay attention to the full ones when he comes to his wine jugs because he knows that they are full. But he is concerned lest the empty ones have turned sour because empty jars quickly turn sour and the wine's good taste is lost. In the same way, the devil comes and tempts all the servants of God. Those who are strong in the faith resist him and he goes away from them because he cannot find entrance. So he goes then to the empty, and finding an entrance, he goes into them. Thus he accomplishes in them whatever he pleases, and makes them his slaves. 6. Even former sinners can overcome the devil. I, the angel of repentance, am telling you, Do not fear the devil, for I have been sent, he said, to be on the side of you who repent with your whole heart and to steady you in the faith. Put your faith in God, you who despair of your life because of your sins, you who add to your sins and make your life burdensome. Trust that if you turn to the Lord with your whole heart and do righteousness for the rest of your life, serving Him uprightly in accordance with His will, He will provide a remedy for your previous failings, and you will obtain the power of mastering the devil's snares. Do not be in the least afraid of the devil's threats, for they are as powerless as a dead man's sinews. Listen to me. Fear Him who has power to save and to destroy. Keep all the mandates, and you will live to God. I said to him, Sir, I have now gained strength in all the justifications of the Lord, because you are on my side. I know that you will break down all the devil's power, and we shall have the mastery over him and overcome all his snares. Sir, I now hope, with the Lord's help, to be able to keep these commandments you have given. You will keep them, he said, if your heart is made pure to the Lord. All those also who cleanse their hearts of the vain desires of this world will keep them and will live to God. This has been The Shepherd of Hermes, Mandates, translated by Joseph M. F. Marik S. J., Ph.D., narrated by James T. Majewski, copyright 1947 by the Catholic University of America Press, production copyright 2024 by Trinity Communications. This podcast is a production of catholicculture.org. Check out our other podcasts, including Way of the Fathers, an early church history podcast hosted by Jim Papandrea, Criteria, the Catholic film podcast, featuring deep analysis of great films from a Catholic perspective, and the Catholic Culture podcast, an interview show exploring Catholic arts, culture, and issues. You'll find all of this and more at catholicculture.org.